Hello and welcome to Magic the Judging episode 14 where uh, I, Paul Smith, level 3 judge from uh, England based on the Isle of Wight, uh, I'm going to be taking you through prevention effects which are a special case of replacement effects. Um, if you're playing along at home, if you want to follow the comprehensive rules as I'll be going through them, uh, you want to load up the comprehensive rules now and check out rules 614 through 616. That's what I'm going to be taking you through with uh, examples today. Um, I just want to get a quick word in to say uh, well done to everybody at uh, GP Malmo. It sounded like an awesome tournament. Uh, sorry that I couldn't be there myself, but, you know, a little bit exhausted with all the judging I have been doing. Um, so thank you for, you know, upholding our amazing judgeness with a fantastic GP. So uh, that should have given you enough time to get the comprehensive rules up. Um, we've, we've just been having a bit of a chat, just before I've come on air, just been having a chat about, um, about this project and how it's been something like four months. I'm being told that the first episode, state-based actions, of this stream was broadcast way back on February the 7th. We've got February, March, April, May. If we get to June, June the 7th, that'll be four months. That's not very long away, is it? No, wow. So, episode 14, replacement effects. Here we go. Get your comprehensive rules open to 614, replacement effects. What is a replacement effect? It's a good place to start. They're not quite so um, obvious as triggered, but I'm looking quite low in my video there. I'm, I'm technical issues. Here, let's, let's adjust my seat. Let's get this right. It's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Yeah? Yeah, come on. Okay, um, replacement effects. They're slightly more difficult to um, spot than triggered abilities. Um, everyone kind of knows triggered abilities. You just uh, you, you can roll them off uh, off the tongue pretty quickly. Triggered abilities. They begin with when, whenever, or at. That's it. That's how. That's exactly how you identify one. How do you identify a replacement effect? Well, most of you will probably go, "Oh, replacement effects." Uh, they use the word instead, don't they? And you would be right. To a point. Here's a picture of Blightsteel Colossus. Blightsteel Colossus is a humongous artifact creature, 12 costing 11 11, with trample and effect. It's the one shot robot. It's indestructible. It's got everything. I'd love to reanimate him into play or something, but I won't be able to do that. Not very easily, because if Blightsteel Colossus would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, reveal Blightsteel Colossus and shuffle it into its low owner's library instead. There's that poster word, instead. That's a replacement effect. So, uh, Blightsteel Colossus' fourth ability is a replacement effect that stops it ever going to the graveyard. I want to call out now that this is very different to a set of uh, triggers that say something along the lines of when this is put into the graveyard, shuffle it into a library. That would be a triggered ability. Triggered abilities use the stack. Things that use the stack can be responded to. For a small, brief window of time, the card would be in the graveyard and able to be reanimated. Um, Emrakul is uh, an example of this one. Um, but Blightsteel Colossus being a replacement effect, the original event never happens. If Blightsteel Colossus would be put into a graveyard, don't do it. It never goes there. Just go straight into Shuffle into the Library instead. Not something you can respond to. It doesn't use the stack. Important, that one. Okay, let's have a look. What other kinds of effects are replacement effects? It turns out there's quite a few. Some of them are quite niche. Um, some of them don't look like replacement effects at all, but when you look into it, um, you can't really imagine them being anything else. Let's have a look. 614.1b. Effects that use the word skip are replacement effects. Here's Stonehorn Dignitary. When he enters the battlefield, target opponent skips his or next combat phase. Skipping a combat phase, that's a replacement effect. It's quite a simple replacement effect because it's replacing something with nothing. It's quite difficult for that to interact with uh, other replacement effects as it happens, which makes it relatively simple to rule on. Skipping a combat phase is exactly the same as replacing your combat phase with nothing at all. Um, effects that read this permanent enters the battlefield with or as this permanent enters the battlefield or this permanent enters the battlefield as blah 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 these are all replacement effects so here's some examples of that one 
Um, sorry, I'm, yes, I'm being reminded in the chat. Stonehorn Dignitary's ability is actually a triggered ability, but the resolution of the triggered ability creates a replacement effect, um, whereas Blightsteel Colossus, uh, it, his ability isn't a triggered ability at all, it's a static ability which generates a replacement effect. At some point, I should probably go into the, the, the terminology of abilities versus effects, uh, but this probably isn't the stream for it. Um, because I have so many cards to go through. But yes, triggered ability that creates a replacement effect uh, that will happen some point later. Carnifex Demon has amongst its text an ability that says Carnifex Demon enters the battlefield with two minus one minus one counters on it. There's no instead on that. So how do I know it's a replacement ability? Well, it's exactly because of uh, 614.1c, which says that enters the battlefield with is a replacement effect. Let's have a think about this. If it's a replacement effect, what is it replacing? And the simple answer is it's replacing entering the battlefield with an event that looks a lot like entering the battlefield, but is actually entering the battlefield with two minus one minus one counters on it. Um, there's a couple of reasons why this is important. Carnifex Demon comes into play as a 4-4, it doesn't become a 6-6 six, six and then get some counters, which will shrink it. Um, it's always a 4-4 four, four at the, the immediate moment that it comes into play. We've taken the event, Carnifex Demon comes into play, and we've replaced it with the event, Carnifex Demon enters the battlefield with two minus one minus one counters on it. Excuse me, switching my terminology here. I still haven't got enters the battlefield drilled into my head like I should. Um, adaptive Automaton. As Adaptive Automaton enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. That's a replacement effect. Because what you're doing is you're replacing Adaptive Automaton comes in, uh, enters the battlefield with Adaptive Automaton enters the battlefield and you chose a creature type. It, again, you don't choose the creature type whilst it's in play. It comes into play... Um, simultaneously with the uh, the choice of creature type. You already know the spell's resolved at that point, um, although, I, uh, as a brief aside here, players will often do something like tap three lands and go, Adaptive Automaton for elves or something? Yeah, why did I choose Adaptive Automaton? Why did I challenge myself with such a tongue twister? Ah, woo. Adaptive automaton, adaptive automaton, adaptive automaton, adaptive automaton. I, yeah, that could that could be like the backing track to the layer song or something. I don't know. Um, as adaptive automaton enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. It's a replacement effect because it doesn't happen on resolution. Whilst players will do that a lot, they will go um, adaptive automaton for um, for elves. I don't know. Adaptive automaton for zombies. Whatever, but they've all they've got lords that are actually good. But who's a tribe that really needs adaptive automaton? I don't know. Chuck it down on illusions or something. No, they've got a lord as well. Oh, I don't know. Brushwags. There we go. There's a creature type that doesn't see enough love. Players will occasionally, uh, on announcement, go adaptive automaton for this, um, which is technically too early. And the shortcut rules say, well, we'll hold them to it. We we don't let them like bait their opponent and then when adaptive automata comes to play they get to choose something else um they just uh they, they get held to the choice because they made it early yeah. but the correct way to cast this is to cast adaptive automaton when it goes to resolve you choose a creature type as it resolves and before it's actually come into play there isn't an in-between zone um you, if you if you're a computer scientist and you're used to, you're used to databases, you understand the um, the concept of transactions. Um, the game state has adaptive automaton on the stack with no creature type chosen, and the next moment the game state has the adaptive automaton in play with the um, creature type chosen. And so its static ability uh, has effect straight away. There isn't an in-between state. Now, if you are actually, say, writing a computer, uh, a computer program to simulate magic, you probably would actually have the steps happen in some kind of discrete order. Um, but what's important is the game never sees uh, an intermediate state. 
Um, or if you don't want to think about databases, think about like bank transactions. If I transfer ten pounds to you, um, then you're incredibly lucky because uh, I haven't done any competitions through which you would win ten pounds. But let's just say, out of the kindness of my heart, I was going to do that. Um, you would never want the bank to see a state in which the £10 is not in my account and it's not in your account either. It would have to move instantaneously from my account to yours. Um, real life sees it in my account and then in your account um, and no intermediate state. And banking would be terribly broken if that didn't work. And yes, I do owe Kim money, that's absolutely correct. I shall be enacting this changing of money uh, right after the stream. Um, so, yes, I hope we're all clear on that. Fantastic. Let's have a look at another replacement effect. This is a great one. Clone. You may have clone enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield. So this is, again, a replacement effect. And it, again, it's kind of clear here why it has to be a replacement effect. Clone is a naught naught. If it wasn't a replacement effect, the, the, the copy ability, then clone would exist, even for the briefest amount of time, on the battlefield as a zero zero. And if state based actions got checked at any point, your clone would die before you got the choice done. So it's actually quite important that clone's ability is uh, treated as a replacement effect. So the coming into play as a zero zero clone never happens, and instead a replacement happens, a replacement event happens. So yes, that's another um, example of uh, a replacement effect. Here's a few more for good measure. Essence of the Wild has creatures you control into the battlefield as a copy of Essence of the Wild. So that's not a replacement effect that affects Essence of the Wild itself, but it, will re it affects other things. So it replaces what other things do, how they come into play. Um, Due respect is an instant that sets up a replacement effect. It says that permanence will enter the battlefield tap this turn. So that replaces um, that replaces this enters the battlefield with this enters the battlefield tapped. And that replacement effect is uh, in play, as it were, um, for the whole of the turn. Um, Vesuvian Shapeshifter, it has something very much like clone with the as it comes into play you may choose another creature and play and blah, 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 it's a copy. But it also has, or is turned face up. So a Vesuvian shapeshifter that's face down gets turned face up, has an ability happen. And again, it's a static ability that creates a replacement effect. So it never turns face up as a Vesuvian shapeshifter if you were choosing to copy something else. Woo! So they're all replacement effects. Let's move on. Now we've identified some. Some replacement effects apply to damage from a source. That's an interesting thing for them to tell us in the rules, isn't it? 614.2. Some replacement effects apply to damage from a source. Lovely. Brilliant. But it, 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 it's not exactly illuminating, that one, is it? Um, I actually have a couple of examples of... Um, sorry, I realise I've, I've got my, my words out of order here. Um, I have another couple of examples of replacement effects. Uh, regenerate Cudgel Troll. That's a replacement effect. Regenerate replaces destroyed with tap it, remove all damage from it and remove it from combat. So it's a reasonably complex one, but it is another replacement effect. It's the next time this creature would be destroyed, it isn't. Instead, tap it and so on. Um, instead is here in the reminder text, but it's just a clue that uh, regenerate actually is a, um, a replacement effect. And if you look in the comprehensive rules for regenerate, it will have it explain exactly what Regenerate means spelled out. Um, other replacement effects can be hidden away on, on cards. Um, here's Stinkweed Imp, uh, quite a, a key component of the, the so-called Dredge deck, as it has Dredge 5. What's Dredge 5? It's a replacement effect, because it, would, it takes the event of you drawing a card and replaces it with putting five cards on top of your life into your graveyard. And if you do manage to do that, then you uh, can return the uh, the card you dredged from your graveyard to your hand, if you can't do that, then you draw a card. So you can't get out of drawing yourself to death just because you have a dredge uh, card in your graveyard. Um, 
There are no special restrictions on casting spell or activating ability that generates a replacement effect. Such effects last until they're used up or their duration has expired. I'll go back to Culture Troll for an example of that. Green mana, activated ability, regenerate Culture Troll. You can activate this ability anytime you like. Um, okay, that's not true. You can activate that ability anytime you could uh, play an instant. Yes, that's different to anytime you like, don't you know? Um, once you've activated it and it resolves, what you do is you set up a replacement effect that will happen at some other time. Um, you can regenerate whenever you like. You can regenerate Cultural Troll in your upkeep. There doesn't have to be any damage pointed to it. If there's a lightning bolt on the stack targeting Cultural Troll, that's probably a really good time to activate Regenerate Cultural Troll and set up a, a, a regeneration shield, as it were. Um, but that's not a prerequisite. You do not have to do so. Someone mind slavers you and wants you to activate the regeneration ability loads of times for some reason, they can just do it. There, ha there has to be no good reason for them to regenerate. You just do it. It sets up a regeneration shield. Um, however, replacement effects must exist before the appropriate event, the one that they would replace, actually happens. They can't go back in time and change something that already has happened. So if Lightning Bolt resolves and Cardinal Troll takes three damage, it's way too late for me to activate Regenerate Cardinal Troll at that point. State-based actions will uh, destroy the Cardinal Troll and uh, cart him off to the graveyard before you can get that ability activated. Um, yeah, so you, you can do it whenever you like. You can do the regeneration anytime you like. There's no specific like window in which you must do it. But there's certainly a point at which it's too late to have any kind of effect. Um, moving on, 614.5. A replacement effect doesn't invoke itself repeatedly. It only gets one opportunity to an effect an event. There's a really good reason for that. Let's have a look at Furnace of Wrath. If a source would deal damage to a creature or player, it deals double that damage to that creature or player instead. So I want you to imagine that 614.5 doesn't exist. And what I want you to, to imagine is that I'm going to Lightning Bolt you. So Furnace of Wrath goes, oh, Lightning Bolt is going to deal three damage to me. Uh, I'd better replace that. I'm going to replace that three damage with double that, uh, three, double that, that's six. Okay, Lightning Bolt is going to do six damage to you. Now, if Rule 614.5 didn't exist, Furnace of Wrath would go, oh, 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 um, Lightning Bolt's about to do six damage to... Um, to to you, I better replace that. I better replace that with double that. Oh, double double six, double six. That's twelve. Twelve. Lightning bolt's going to do twelve damage to you. Oh oh oh! Lightning bolt's about to do twelve damage to you. I better replace that. Uh, double twelve. That's twenty four. Lightning bolt's going to do twenty four damage to you, and so on. And we'd keep replacing this effect again and again and again. And lightning bolt would never actually get to deal any damage because furnace of wrath would keep interrupting it, and um, the world would implode probably. So that's why Furnace of Wrath doesn't break the game, because there's a rule that says it doesn't. Isn't that good? Um, we'll come back to... No, there's no point coming back to it. An example of where Furnace of Wrath might apply multiple times is if you actually had multiple furnaces in play. Let's say you had two. Um, you've got two replacement effects that might apply to the lightning bolt dealing three damage. And once you've applied one of them, you've got the lightning bolt dealing six damage. The other one can still see the lightning bolt dealing six damage and then double that to 12. But at that point, once both permanents have applied their um, replacement effects, they don't get to uh, apply the replacement effects again. They don't get to bounce uh, between each other. So lightning bolt would deal 12 if you had two furnace rats out and 24 if you had three and 48 if you... <laughs> oh, people are arguing about the artwork of Furnace of Wrath. That's brilliant. That's the weather light in there, apparently. I don't think I'd ever looked at the art of that card, really. There's some big kind of lavery mess. And damage is happening. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. If an event is replaced, it never happens. A modified event occurs instead, which might in turn trigger abilities. Note that the modified event might contain instructions that can't be carried out. In which case, the impossible instruction is simply ignored. Um, did I come up with a good example for this? Um, no, it doesn't look like I did. Uh, maybe I skipped reading that rule. Hmm. Um, 
So if an event is replaced, it never happens. Here's an example. Stink we dim. If I was going to draw a card, but instead I dredge, then I didn't draw a card. So if I have something else in play, some kind of triggered ability that says, uh, whenever you draw a card, do something. I don't know, um, Underworld Dreams, for instance. Um, uh, I could very quickly download that and get it on the stream, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to say that Underworld Dreams is an enchantment that uh, says whenever your opponent draws a card, um, they take one damage or lose one life. One of those. It's a black enchantment. Probably lose one life. Um, if you replace your draw with the dredge, and the draw never happened, so the whenever an opponent draws a card trigger on Underworld Dreams will also never happen. Um, because the modified event occurred instead. Similarly, if a replacement effect would replace an event, but the event never happens, then the replacement effect simply doesn't do anything. So if you were going to draw a card, but for some reason you didn't, uh, maybe because Marilyn the Morn song is out that says players can't draw cards or something like that. Um, you're going to draw a card, but you didn't. Um, does that apply? Hmm. Yeah. If you were going to draw a card, but you didn't, then you never get to replace it with something else because you didn't get to draw a card anyway. So how could you replace your drawn card if you didn't get to do it? This also kind of comes into play a little bit later when we talk about how replacement effects interact. So that will come up in a moment. Um there's a specific example of if a replacement effect would replace an event, but the event never happens. There's a kind of a subcase of that in 614.7a that says that if a source would deal zero damage, then it actually doesn't deal damage. Here's an example. Blaze. Blaze would deal X damage to target creature or player. So if I cast Blaze, but I set X equal to zero, then Blaze deals zero damage to target creature or player. Now, Blaze is dealing zero damage, it's actually not dealing damage at all, which is important for replacement effects like Pyromancer's Swathe, which say if an instant or sorcery source you control would deal damage, then it would deal that much damage plus two. So, with Blaze and Pyromancer's Swathe, can I Blaze someone for two by paying one mana by setting x equal to zero? No, I can't, because if Blaze is dealing zero damage, it doesn't deal damage at all. If it's not dealing damage at all, this ability can't replace it. Hmm. Um, oh, okay. And then we have a specific rule about regeneration. So I'll flash Cuddle Troll back up on the screen. Rege regeneration is specifically a destruction replacement effect. The word instead doesn't appear on the card, or except in this case it does, but only in the reminder text. So officially it doesn't appear on the card. Um, it's implicit in the definition. Regenerate means the next time this will be destroyed this turn. Instead, remove all damage marked on it and tap it. If it's an attacking or blocking creature, remove it from combat. Abilities that trigger from damage being dealt will still trigger even if the permanent regenerates. Well, that's kind of um, obvious because your regeneration is um, uh, it's replacing the, the destruction event not the damage event. So the damage happens, the damage causes the destruction through state-based actions, um, the destruction gets replaced, but the damage still happens. So anything that triggers off of that um, will still trigger. Okay, some effects will replace damage dealt to one creature, planeswalker, or player with the same damage dealt to another creature, planeswalker, or player. And such effects are called redirection effects. Now I've brought two examples here. Which one of these is the redirection effect? Harm's Way or Divine Deflection? I'll oracle text you. Harm's Way says the next two damage that a source of your choice will deal to you and or permanence you control this turn is dealt to target creature or player instead. Divine Deflection says, prevent the next X damage that would be dealt to you and or permanents you control this turn, and if damage is prevented this way, Divine Deflection deals that much damage to target creature or player. Okay, Harm's Way is a redirection effect, because it just changes the, uh, the, the, the target of the, uh, of the damage. It's just moving the damage from one, plane, one point to another. Divine Deflection is actually a different kind of ability. It's a prevention ability that's then got something tacked on to the end of it. Um, this is actually really important, the difference between these two cards. Um, as an example, um, 
as an example, what if I had um, protection from red, say? I've got a creature with protection from red, and a red source is going to deal damage. And I harm's way it onto something else. I'm going to harm's way it over to you, but you've got protection from red. Now, protection from red won't stop you being targeted by harm's way. Harm's way is white. So I can target you, and that's that resolves. I set up my redirection effect. But when I go to redirect the damage, you can't take the damage because the original red source that would deal the damage is still dealing the damage. The source of the damage is still red, so your protection from red kicks in and stops you taking the damage. On the other hand, Define Deflection prevents the damage from the red source and then deals damage to the target itself. Divine Deflection is white, so the damage was now coming from a white source and you can take it. It's a critical difference between the two cards and it's easily missed. Um, there's all sorts of other things uh, in here. Um, if you prevented combat damage and then redealt it with Define Deflection, then it's not combat damage anymore. Um, if you redirect combat damage with harm's way, it's still combat damage. Because harm's way isn't dealing it, it's still the original source. Um, there's also tricks to do with planeswalkers, because you, can, you can't uh, say... If, if damage is coming from a source you control, and it's going to your head, you're not allowed to redirect it to one of your planeswalkers. That's something you're only your opponent's allowed to do. Um, Harm's way makes that quite tricky. If I'm if I make some damage and you harm's way it back to me, but I still control the source of the damage, then I can't then go. Oh, I'm going to take damage from harm's way. Therefore, I'll redirect it onto my planeswalker. Like it it, it doesn't work. Um, that doesn't work anyway because I don't, I don't get the choice to redirect it onto my planeswalker. I think what I mean is uh, I don't get to redirect uh, the damage that you're doing. If I redirect it to you, I don't then get to push it onto your, your planeswalker. I didn't make much sense there, did I? Shall I try that again? If you're going to deal me damage, and I use harm's way to redirect it back to you, you're still dealing the damage, so I'm not allowed to redirect it to one of your planeswalkers because it's damage from a source you control. It's so for exactly the same reason that if you tap pain land and take damage from a pain land, I can't go, no, 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 I don't want you to take damage from that, I want your Jace to take damage from that, it doesn't work. Um, with Define Deflection, because Define Deflection is going to be the source of the damage and it's my Define Deflection, I exactly can redirect it onto a Planeswalker as well. Very subtle, isn't it? I hope everyone got that. Um, please do ask questions away in the chat um, if you want some uh, additional clarification on that one. Um, okay, yeah, so some effects will replace damage dealt to one creature with another. That's called a redirection effect. If either creature or planeswalker is no longer on the battlefield when the damage would be redirected, is no longer a creature or a planeswalker when the damage would be redirected, then the effect doesn't do anything. Uh, and if the damage would be redirected to or from a player who's left the game, the effect does nothing. So if I cast Harm's Way and say, OK, the next two damage that's going to be dealt to me, actually I'm going to deal it to that creature instead, and then the creature goes away, the redirection doesn't happen, so I still take the damage. If I use Define Deflection instead, then all I'm told is to prevent the next two damage uh, that would be dealt to me, so I prevent it. And then I go, deal that much to that target creature that was over there, but the creature isn't there anymore, so I don't get to do the dealing part, but that doesn't stop the preventing part happen, happening. Just to be absolutely clear, the creature didn't go away with Divine Deflection on the stack, that would lead to it being countered, because Divine Deflection only has one target, and obviously if the target goes away, the spell's illegal and it won't resolve. So if Divine Deflection resolved but the, the creature I was going to damage with Define Deflection later goes away, that doesn't stop damage being prevented to me. I've belaboured the point a little bit between these two, but I, I hope you understand why. It's uh, subtle, subtle differences between the two cards. Um, 
I, th I wrote a, back in the days where I used to write articles for websites. I believe I wrote an entire article about Harm's Way because of all the somewhat slightly in unintuitive things it does. Um, I much prefer the templating on Divine Deflection. I hope they keep it that way. Cool. Um, let's move on. An effect that causes a player to skip an event, step, phase, or turn is a replacement effect. We've been told that earlier. Here's an example of one. It's Jose in Morningstar. He uh, or she, I don't know. How do you sex a dragon? I haven't got a clue. Um, when it's put into a graveyard from play, the target player will skip his or her next untapped step. Anything scheduled for the next occurrence of something, um, they wait for the first occurrence that hasn't been skipped. That's called a couple of implications. If two effects cause a player to skip their next untapped step, then one of them is satisfied. When the, when the next untapped step comes along, I'm going to have an untapped step. Yose says, no, nope, no, you're not. And that one's satisfied. But the other Yosei that was in play, because, you know, they're legends, so that's what you did with this dragon. You got two of them in play, so you got them to skip two untapped steps. The second one goes, I haven't replaced an untapped step yet. The first one got replaced with nothing, and I didn't get a chance to apply to it. So I'm going to wait for the next one. Bottom line, as long as Mirror Gallery isn't in play, if someone gets two Yoseis in play, you're going to skip two untapped steps. Um... Once a step, phase, or turn has started, it can no longer be skipped. Um, that doesn't really apply to the untapped step, because it's difficult to make that happen. But let's grab Stonehorn Dignitary up. If you somehow flashed Stonehorn Dignitary into uh, the battlefield um, during a combat phase, then you don't skip that combat phase, you wait for the next one. You don't skip this combat phase, you skip the next one. Um, anything that's been scheduled for a skipped step, phase, or turn won't happen. But anything that's scheduled for the next occurrence will just wait around for the first occurrence that isn't skipped. So most of the time, any, uh, things will happen at the, at the next occurrence. Um, uh, here's an example of one that isn't. This one says, at end of turn, discard your hand. If your end step's been skipped, then that won't happen. So... Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of how this could happen. You've got a Pyromancer Swag in play. You go to end a turn without a trigger. No, it needs to be a delayed trigger, doesn't it? Um, what's the what's the double blue sorcery? Um, Ideas Unbound, that's the one. There's a card called Ideas Unbound that has you um, draw three cards, but at the end of turn, you discard three cards. Um, that no, no, damn it! That one says discard three cards at the beginning of the next end step. That's been rotted in Oracle. Ah, rubbish. Um, so that will wait around. If you manage to draw three cards off of Ideas Unbound um, and then skip your end step, then at your next end step you would still have to remember to discard three cards. That's quite tricky because that's not what's written on the card. But hey, that's what we have Oracle text for. Um, are there any triggers left that trigger at the, um, like, set up a delayed trigger to do something at the end of this turn and only at the end of this turn? Huh. I'm being told about Final Fortune. Let's have a look at that. Final Fortune. What does that say in Oracle? Bum, ba, bum, ba, bum. Okay, Final Fortune says that you take an extra turn after this one, and at the beginning of that turn's end step, you lose the game. That's a rather nice delayed triggered ability. If that end step was skipped, Final Fortune is happy. Something was scheduled for an end step that never happened, therefore Final Fortune's effect doesn't take place, you don't lose the game, and you just carry on. Nice one, thank you very much uh, for that example. Okay. Um, ba -ba -bom, ba -ba -da -bom. Some effects cause a player to skip a step, a phase, or a turn, and then take another action. Um, was that this one? Was that this one? Yes. Here's an example of it. I I had to use IRC as a, quite a resource last night. I've been doing so much like preparation for this one that um, I, there were examples I just couldn't come up with. 
and he was he was one of them. And so I really have to thank the guys on IRC for uh, helping me out with this one. Side effects cause a player to skip a step phase or turn and then take another action. Here's one. Fasting is an enchantment that says that you may choose to skip your draw step. And if you do skip your draw step, you gain two life. When do you gain the two life? Well, you can't be gaining it in the draw step that never happened. And this rule, in fact, tells us the action is considered to be the first thing that happens during the next step phase or turn that actually occurs. So if you skip your draw step in order to gain two life, then you're actually gaining two life in your main phase, in case that's relevant for whatever reason. Um, some effects replace card draws. We already saw one of those. Um, here's another example. One, Words of War is a great enchantment that has an activated ability that when you uh, set it up, uh, the next time you would draw a card this turn, then Words of War deals two damage to target creature or player instead. Um, this would be applied even if no cards could be drawn because there aren't any cards in your library. That's an interesting one. The next time you would draw a card, even if there's no cards in your library to draw, you can replace that draw with doing damage instead, which is a great way to stop yourself decking. You, you won't die to state-based actions um, if you've got words of war and mana. Nice. Um, if an effect replaces a draw within a sequence of draws, then all the actions required by the replacement are completed before resuming the sequence. So this requires you to know that if you were to draw three cards, um, is this an example of one? No. If you were to like, draw three cards off of this, you have to know that that's actually draw a card, draw a card, draw a card. And so if the first one of those draw a cards got replaced with something else, then you do the whole of the replacement effect before you do draw the second and third card. So again, if you if you got Words of War and you've activated it twice, and then you draw three cards, then the first time you would draw a card, you deal two damage instead, and then the second time you would, would draw a card, you deal two damage instead, and then after you've dealt the four damage, you then draw another card. Um, I'm not sure of a point where the timing's uh, relevant, but you know, someone will, someone will come up with one one day. Um, if an effect would have a player both draw a card and perform an additional action on that card, but the draw got replaced, then the additional action is not performed. I had to ask for help on this one again, but I got it in the form of Sindbad. Sindbad was uh, one of the purple cards reprinted in Time Spiral, and it says draw a card and reveal it. If it isn't a land card, discard it. So if I replace the draw a card with something else, like, say, Dredging 5 off a Stinkweed Imp, then what do I do with the rest of the instruction? How can I reveal the card I drew if I didn't actually draw a card? And this is exactly what this rule tells us. We're on 614.11b. If an effect would have a player both draw a card and perform an additional action on that card, and the draw is replaced, the additional action is not performed on any cards that are drawn as a result of that replacement effect. So... If I replaced it with Words of War, it's quite obvious I never drew a card, so there's nothing for me to reveal and, and, and discard. If I dredged, you might convince yourself that, well, I dredged a Stinkweed Imp, so I should reveal a Stinkweed Imp, but because it's not a land, I'll discard it. You might convince yourself that, but it's not true. It doesn't happen. Um, the draw got replaced. Dredge doesn't lead to me drawing a card anyway, but because the draw got replaced, I don't have to do anything here. If I was actually to replace my draw with something else that also included drawing a card, um, for which I don't have an example off the top of my head right now, um, then even though I still ended up ultimately drawing a card, I still don't have to reveal it and do the additional action for Sinbad. It just gets chucked away. Cool. 614.1 to, oh, the second half of Read the Runes doesn't apply here, right? Let's have a look at that. Read the Runes. Draw X cards. For each card drawn this way, discard a card from your hand unless you sacrifice permanent. Yes, if the draw got replaced because you didn't draw the card, then I don't think you have to discard or sacrifice because it got replaced. You didn't actually draw. So if, you, if, if X is 5, but you only actually draw 2 cards then you discard two cards or sacrifice two permanents. Okay, there's some tricky interactions uh, going on in this rule. 614.12 has quite a lot of text to it. 
Um, it's, first of all, it says that some replacement effects will modify how a permanent enters the battlefield. Here's an example. Scarwood Tree Folk has a replacement effect that tells itself to come into play tapped. Nice. Effects. Um, oh, OK. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Someone has just mentioned Thought Reflection. Thought Reflection is a card which I believe says if you would draw a card draw two cards instead. So, if I Sinbad to draw a card and reveal it, and if it isn't a land, discard it, and that gets replaced with drawing two cards, then I don't have to reveal or discard either of the cards I actually drew because of Thought Reflection's effect. The, the whole original draw event got replaced, including the additional actions. Thank you very much there, Kim. Good job. Back to Scarwood Tree Folk. Scarwood Tree Folk has a replacement ability, uh, sorry, a static ability that generates a replacement effect on it that replaces how it comes into play with it coming into play tapped instead. Um, to determine which replacement effects apply and how they apply, you should check the characteristics of the permanent as it exists on the battlefield, taking into account replacement effects that have already modified how it enters the battlefield. Crikey, there are... Uh, how many times did I read this last night and it's still tripping me up? Okay, I'm just going to jump straight to the examples of the rule. Yixler Jailer says that cards in graveyards lose all abilities. So my Scarwood Tree Folk that's in the graveyard doesn't have that ability. But even if I put Scarwood Tree Folk onto the battlefield from a graveyard, because this rule is checking me, checking me? telling me to check the abilities and it would exist on the battlefield, it's telling me, ignore Yixler Jailer, that doesn't matter. When it It's going to come into play with an ability that says it comes into play tapped, therefore it comes into play tapped. The, the state after coming into play is the one that matters. Um, I guess by example that means uh, if I had humility in play that said the creatures don't have, um, don't have abilities, then my Skullwood Tree Folk would actually come into play untapped. Um, Orb of Dreams is an artifact that says permanents enter the battlefield tapped. And this one's quite interesting, I think, actually, because, uh, again, I didn't realise this at the time, probably because I didn't think about it too much, and well, probably because this card didn't actually see all that much play at the time. But Orb of Dreams doesn't cause itself to come into play tapped. And it's because there's a specific exception in this rule. It says that uh, you ignore... Uh, you ignore continuous effects from any other sources uh, that would affect the permanents coming into play. Um, yeah, there's a there's a specific thing. Yeah, right at the start of the rule, it says um, some replacement effects modify how a permanent enters the battlefield. The effects we're talking about might come from the permanents itself if they affect only that permanent, as opposed to a general subset of permanents that happens to include it. So this is an example. Orb of Dreams, it says that permanence come into play tapped, but it doesn't cause itself to come into play tapped because it's talking about a set of permanence that happens to include Orb of Dreams. It's different to Scarwood Tree Folk. Scarwood Tree Folk is specifically calling out itself, so it comes into play tapped. Orb of Dreams isn't specifically calling out itself, so it doesn't cause itself to come into play tapped. It only causes permanents that come into play after it to come into play tapped. Not entirely intuitive, that one, is it? I wouldn't worry about it too much, rather you. I've got this far as a judge without even knowing that was a rule. But that's what we're here for, isn't it? Global education and so on. Um, let's move on from that rather ugly-looking rule and say that an effect that modifies how a permanent enters the battlefield may cause other objects to change zones. Such an effect can't cause the permanent itself to not enter the battlefield. And the, the literally textbook example is Sutured Ghoul. Um, as Sutured Ghoul enters the battlefield, you can exile any number of creature cards from your graveyard. Now, let's say you were reanimating Sutured Ghoul. You might think, ha ha, I can cause some kind of strange anomaly here where as Sutured Ghoul enters the battlefield, I can exile guards from my graveyard, which means I could exile the sutured ghoul, which means that would stop it coming into play somehow. And, ooh, that would be weird, wouldn't it? So that's why this rule exists. You can't do it. If sutured ghoul is coming to play from the bath from the graveyard, 
I'll try again. If a sutured ghoul is entering the battlefield from the graveyard, you don't get to exile itself using its own replacement ability, causing some kind of weird grandfather paradox where you were never born and um, we have to get the DeLorean to 6.7 gigawatts or whatever. Um, can't do it. So you can't use an object's own replacement effect to stop it from entering the battlefield. Uh, there's a thing here about linked abilities, and Sutra Gore is actually an example of this, so I'll leave it up. An object might have one ability printed on it that generates a replacement effect that causes one or more cards to be exiled, such as exiles and guards, please, and, the other, and a second ability that refers to cards exiled with this. Or talking about the exiled cards. Like it does here, Sutured Ghoul's power is equal to the total power of the exiled cards. It's talking about the exiled cards. So because it's talking about the exiled cards, this is a linked ability. It's a replacement, uh, it's a static ability with, that generates a replacement effect, linked with a static ability that's actually a, a characteristic defining ability for power and toughness, but the two are linked. Um... If an object gains a pair of linked abilities, they'll be similarly linked on that object. They can't be linked to any other ability, regardless of what other abilities the object may currently have or may have had in the past. So if Sujigul somehow becomes a copy of something else that's got some linked abilities, it's got something to do with exiled cards, that is a nice loophole that used to exist at some point, but doesn't anymore. It's talking literally about this ability. It has been fixed. Woohoo! Um... Uh, some replacement effects are not continuous effects. Rather, they're an effect of a resolving spell or ability that replaces part or all of that spell or ability's own effects. Here's one, Remand. Remand tells you to counter a spell. Now, countering a spell normally means putting it in the graveyard, except Remand tells you that if you did counter the spell, return the spell card to its owner's hand. Um, this is an example of a self-replacement effect, and if you are applying replacement effects to an event, you have to make sure that you apply self-replacement effects first, and then any other replacement effects. But there you go. Remand is self-replacement, so that might be a thing. Okay. The next rule, 615, is all about prevention effects, which is a particular kind of subclass of replacement effects. I'm going to skip them just now, just because I'm conscious about time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to skip ahead to 616, which is how replacement or prevention effects interact. And then assuming I've got enough time, I'll, I'll jump straight back to uh, prevention effects. Okay. So, if two or more replacement and or prevention effects are attempting to modify the way an effect, uh, sorry, an event affects an object or player, the affected object's controller or the affected player chooses one to apply following a couple of steps. As we just learnt, if any of the replacement effects are self-replacement effects, then one of them must be chosen. Um, so here's an example. Snapcast the Mage can give something flashback. I cast something with flashback, and then my opponent goes to remand it. In a sense, you've got two replacement effects trying to do the same thing. I'm trying to remand it back to your hand. Flashback is trying to go, but if you're going to leave the stack, you'd better go to uh, Exile instead. This is a clue that says well, we've got to apply the self-replacement effect first. So we've got to change going to the graveyard to going to the hand. And then we get to apply the, the, the flashback replacement effect that says, oh, no, you're still leaving the stack, so I'm going to exile you instead. Some replacement effects modify under whose control an object would enter the battlefield. So if you, once you've done all of the self-replacement effects, You've got to do control changing replacement effects. Next, gather specimens was the only uh, one of these I could think of. If a creature would come into play under an opponent's control this turn, it comes into play under your control instead. I'll do a quick aside here to say one of my best, one of my favourite magic moments ever was judging at a world championships and somewhere off in the side a bunch of uh, Watsy staff were, uh, were doing, I think they were doing a three on three team draft or something. And I suddenly saw Randy Boiler jump up yelp and run a, a lap of his table before sitting back down high-fiving his team members and continuing on with the draft why because his opponent had played sarkanval used the ultimate the minus six to put five 
four four red dragon creature tokens were flying into play, and Randy had responded with gather specimens and said, "Nope, all of them are mine." Ouch! Ouch! That takes a while to sink in. Just how much of an ouch that is. So, let's go back to this order of uh, replacement effects. First, self-replacement. Next, control-changing replacement effects. Then, copy effects. Essence of the Wild, back there. That's another, another example. Um, any effects that would cause an object to become a copy of another object as it enters the battlefield, one of them must be chosen. And finally any other applicable replacement effects may be chosen. So here's an example of, uh, of this one. If you were to play a Scarwood Tree Folk whilst Essence of the Wild is in play, then you've got, you've, you've got, first of all, you've got Scarwood Tree Folk is going to enter the battlefield. Then you've got two things that are going to replace that. Essence of the Wild wants to replace it with no, a copy of Essence of the Wild is going to enter the battlefield. Scarwood Tree Folk wants to replace it with, nope, Scarwood Tree Folk is going to enter the battlefield. Tapped. This rule says, no, we've got to apply the Essence of the Wild first, so a copy of Essence of the Wild is going to uh, come into play. But then, what we find is, the whilst we originally had two replacement effects that were competing and trying to replace the same effect, the same event, now that one of them is applied, the second one no longer needs to apply. It has nothing to apply to. Because it doesn't exist. Once you've, once you've replaced Scarwood Tree Folk comes into play with a copy of Essence of the Wild comes into play, there is no longer any effect that says Scarwood Tree Folk has to come into play tapped because the Essence of the Wild copy doesn't have it. And this is, this is true in, in general. Once a... Once you've decided which replacement effect is going to apply to an event, the modified event might no longer be applicable for the other things. So let's take an example. Um, we just talked about thought reflection, which replaces drawing a card with drawing two cards instead. And earlier we had uh, words of war, which replaces a card draw with two damage. Now, because both of those things would apply to a card draw, if I'm going to draw a card, I'm going to have to choose one of these things to apply. Um, so if I apply Thought Reflection first, then I replace the draw with two draws. And now Words of War goes, well, you're still drawing a card, so I'd still like to replace that. And replaces at least one of the drawn cards with um, two damage. If I was to apply it the other way round, if I replace the Words of War damage with... Um, if I replace the card draw with two damage, thanks to Words of War, then Thought Reflection will sit there and go, well, you're not drawing cards anymore, so I don't care anymore. Similarly, you could have Words of War and Furnace of Wrath in play, in which case you could go, I was going to draw a card, but I replaced that with damage. And the Furnace of Wrath sees you now and goes, well, I didn't care about you when you were drawing a card, but now you're dealing damage, I want to apply to this, I'm going to replace that with double. Um... So yes, competing replacement effects. You apply one, and then you've got to check all your replacement effects again, because some new ones might apply this time, or some that were going to apply might not anymore. I'm being asked in the chat, um, why don't I have a choice about applying Essence? Um, let's have a look back at that one again. Kim's doing a great job in the, in the chat room of uh, answering this one for me, but uh, I'll cover it uh, myself. You want to have a look at... Um, 616.1 which used to just say if there's two replacement effects that want to apply you choose one um, instead and this is relatively recently and I think it's mainly because Essence of the Wild exists uh, as Kim correctly pointed out and because that was only printed in Innistrad I think it's a, a, a very recent development in the comprehensive rules there is an order of priorities as it were I don't want to say priority. Priority means something completely different. But there's, a, there's an order in which uh, replacement effects have to be chosen. Self-replacement first. Then control changing next. Then 
copies next, and then you get a free choice amongst everything else. So in the case of Scarlet Tree Folk versus Essence of the Wild, you must apply Essence of the Wild's replacement ability first, sorry, replacement effect first, because it's a, a, of a higher order. You don't get the choice to apply Scarwood first. Cool. Awesome. Um, right. Yes. So that is how uh, bouncing um, replacement effects uh, deal with each other. I do have another interesting uh, one here. I don't know if I've invented it because I seem to have lost the thing that says it. But never mind. I'm just going to go ahead with the example anyway. Um, I think this this is really just another example of why um, cards uh, replacement effects can only apply to an event once. So we said it. We we had the simple version with damage and furnace of wrath in play. Well, especially multiple furnace of wraths. Um, each furnace of wrath only gets to apply to the damage once. So if you've got one in play, it will double the damage, and it won't care about the rest of the damage. If you've got two in play, one of them will double it, the other one will double it again, and then you'll end up quadrupling it, but you don't get stuck in a loop. Here's another version of the not getting stuck in a loop. Nefarious Lich says, if you would gain life, draw that many cards instead, amongst one of its many things. Then, Words of Worship says, well, the next time you draw a card, gain life instead. So, Nefarious Lich can apply to the original event of... Um, gaining life and turn it into card drawing that can make words of worship apply because while I would be drawing a card so I can gain life but even though the original event has been replaced twice and it's now life gain even though it's a different amount of life Nefarious Lich doesn't get another stab at it you don't get to bounce between the two draw it saying I'm going to gain life, no I'm going to draw cards no I'm going to gain life, no I'm going to draw cards no I'm going to gain life, no I'm going to draw cards no I'm going to gain life I think you get the point. What will happen is you go, I'm going to gain life. Leech says, no, you're going to draw cards. Words of Worship says, no, you're going to gain life. And the Nefarious Leech goes, oh, okay, sure, not going to apply to that again. Cool. Right, let's move on to Fog. Fog prevents all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. This is a, another kind of replacement effect. It's a replacement effect, a subset of replacement effects that are so important, they get their own set of rules. 615 is prevention effects. Some continuous effects are prevention effects. Like replacement effects, prevention effects apply continuously as events happen. They're not locked in ahead of time. They watch for a damage event that would happen, and they completely or partially prevent the damage that would be dealt. They act like shields around whatever they're affecting. So fog is a shield that lasts the entire turn and just prevents everything that looks like combat damage. Um, there are no special restrictions on casting a spell that generates a prevention effect. You can cast Fog at end of turn if you want to. I doubt it will do anything useful, but there is nothing illegal about it. Like our example with um, regeneration earlier, the prevention effect must exist before the appropriate damage event occurs. They can't go back in time and change something that already happened. So most commonly, the replacement, uh, sorry, the prevention effect is activated in response to the damage. So let's take a Boon Acolyte, for instance. Uh, if you're going to shoot one of my creatures, I can respond by preventing the next one damage that would be dealt to that creature. Because I responded and your damage causing ability is still on the stack, I get set up the prevention shield first and then get to prevent the damage. But again, it's not important that there's a lightning bolt on the stack. I can activate the prevention ability whenever I like, even if there's no damage about to happen. Um, an example of why I might want to do this, um, oh, I don't know, you might have something in play that forces all my creatures to attack, if able. So I can tap this to prevent one damage, even though there's no damage being dealt anywhere, just because I want to get it tapped so that it doesn't have to attack. That's perfectly legal. Some prevention effects also include an additional effect, which may refer to the amount of damage that was prevented. Um, I showed you one earlier. Uh, defined deflection was one. It redeals the damage. So it's an effect that's tied into the amount of damage that got prevented. Um, I think Gloom Surgeon here is another one. Yeah. If combat damage would be dealt to Gloom Surgeon, 
Then you prevent that damage and you exile that many cards from the top of your library. Um, the prevention takes place at the time the original event would have happened and the rest of the effect takes place immediately afterward. So uh, if combat damage would be dealt, then prevention happens right then and the exiling that many cards happens immediately afterward. It doesn't trigger and go on stack or anything like that, it just happens straight afterwards. If damage that would be dealt is prevented, it never happens. A modified event may occur instead, that may in turn trigger abilities, but yeah, the damage, it never happens. You, you won't trigger anything off of damage if the damage got replaced. Some prevention effects that are generated by the resolution of a spell or ability refer to a specific amount of damage. We already showed Abuna Acolyte that prevents the next one or the next two, depending on which ability you're using. Each one damage that would be dealt to the shielded creature is prevented. That kind of uses up the shield. Preventing one damage reduces the remaining shield by one. If damage would be dealt by two or more applicable sources at the same time, or if you've got any way a kind of a choice of what to what to prevent, you can choose which point of damage you prevent. This could be really important. Um, if you've got multiple sources of damage, all, deal, all dealing damage at the same time, and some of them have infect, or some of them have death touch, you get to choose which point of damage you prevent, so you're probably going to choose the death touch or the infect, or whichever it is, um, in order to get the, the maximum benefits from your prevention effect. Um, also, Abuna Acolyte, because it cares about the next two damage, if you, uh, if you target an artifact creature, it doesn't matter if the two damage are dealt um, by two different sources as completely separate events, it'll still prevent both. So if you prevent two damage to an artifact creature, and your opponent taps a prodigal pyromancer to deal one to it, and then deals a, uh, taps a second prodigal pyromancer to deal another one to it, the fact that the one damage followed by another one damage were two completely separate events by completely separate sources doesn't matter. They still both get prevented, um, as long as it was this turn, obviously, because that's as long as that shield lasts. Some prevention effects, instead, they, they talk about the next time something would deal damage. It doesn't matter how much damage it is, it just prevents the whole thing. Story Circle is a great example of that one. When you activate it, the next time that source would deal damage, you prevent the whole lot. It's important here that you um, bear in mind that some sources will deal damage lots of times, and some sources will deal damage to lots of things, but as only one event. Um, I've only just thought of this, so I haven't got an example for one of the others um, loaded up. But Pyroclasm deals two damage to each creature. Happens once. It's one damage event. It's doing damage in lots of different places, but it's only one damage event. On the other hand, Branching Bolt is a modal spell um, that says, uh, choose one or both. Branching Bolt deals three damage to target creature with flying, and or... Branching Bolt deals 3 damage to target creature without flying. If you choose both, if you choose both targets there, because the word deals is in there twice, because the verb is in there twice, it's two completely separate sources of um, two completely separate damage events. Branching Bolt deals damage twice. Pyroclasm, whilst it might be damaging 17 things on the battlefield, does it all as one event. So if you story circled it, you would prevent the whole lot. Branching Bolt, because it uses the verb twice, is going to deal damage twice, so you would need to activate Story Circle twice to stop it. A creature with double strike is a, is a, a much simpler example of this, and it's much more obvious that it's dealing damage once, and then it's dealing damage a second time, and so you'd have to activate Story Circle twice. <laughs> Someone's pointed out that the flavour text on Pyroclasm is actually a great hint for what I'm talking about. Who would want to ignite things one at a time? Not Chandra Nalar and not Pyroclasm. It doesn't ignite things one at a time. It sets everything on fire at the same time. Nice. I should point out that it's, it's normal for um, spells that will deal damage to multiple things to actually deal it all as one thing. Uh, branching Bolt is very much the exception, and the reason it's an exception is because of the way it has to be worded in order for its modal nature to come out. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the key is look for verbs. If there are multiple verbs, then there's multiple events. 
Um, okay, that was 615.8, so some prevention effects that are generated by static abilities, they refer to a specific amount of damage. Is this one? Yes, it is. If a source would deal damage for a, to a cleric you control, prevent one of that damage. Great. So if you were going to pyroclasm me, and I had a bunch of clerics in play and a bunch of non-clerics, then all my clerics would take one from the pyroclasm, and all my non-clerics would uh, take two. It doesn't matter how many clerics I've got, um, and it doesn't even matter at, at this point, because the pyroclasm is dealing damage to a cleric, one of that gets prevented. Um, it doesn't matter that the whole damage event is a single event. You might trick yourself into believing, oh hey, Daunting Defender only gets to prevent one of that damage, so I can only prevent one of the entire pyroclasm damage. That's not true. The replacement condition is a source dealing damage to a cleric. So if I've got five clerics in play, then pyroclasm dealing damage to a cleric is happening five times. So for each of those things, I can prevent one of that damage. So I can prevent a, a total of five damage, one to each of my clerics. I think that's clear. It, it, can, it can trap you. If you think you know uh, a lot about prevention effects, then some of these more subtle things can trap you. Whereas if you just try to go the intuitive route in the first place, you probably get it right. I actually quite like the way uh, replacement and prevention effects work. Um, some prevention effects prevent the next end damage that would be dealt. Uh, yeah. Two, a number of untargeted creatures. Um, such an effect creates a prevention shield for each applicable creature when the spell or ability resolves. So if I activate Wojek Apothecary, and I prevent one damage to every white creature that's on the battlefield right now, that will set up a whole bunch of prevention shields right now. Um, and it's for each of those creatures. If one of my white creatures later turns red, it doesn't matter, it still has a prevention shield, so it would still get one damage prevented. It also doesn't matter if a white creature comes into play later, that doesn't have a prevention shield on it, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it will take damage Changing creatures' colour won't add or remove shields. Creatures that enter the battlefield later in turn don't get the shield. Cool. Some effects will state that damage can't be prevented. Here's one. Um, damage can't be prevented this turn. Unstable footing from Zendikar. Uh, there's an additional kicker of actually dealing five damage if you spend a lot of mana. But yeah, unstable footing's like natural ability is to prevent, prevent damage from being prevented. Hmm. That's uh, a bit of a tongue twister. Adaptive automaton. Um, if unpreventable damage would be dealt, such as this, a kicked unstable footing, then any applicable prevention effects are still applied to it. The effect won't prevent any damage, but any additional effect that the replacement effect would have had still happens. Here's an example. Um, unbreathing Horde has uh, a prevention effect. A prevention, yeah, prevention effect on its um, static ability at the bottom. If Unbreathing Horde would be dealt damage, prevent that damage, and remove a plus one plus one counter from it. It's important to note that the removing a plus one plus one counter is not in any way contingent on the damage actually being prevented. If unpreventable damage happened to the Unbreathing Horde, it takes all of that damage, and it still loses a minus, uh, it still loses a plus one plus one counter. Cool. Um, finally, a prevention effect is applied to any particular unpreventable damage event just once. It won't invoke itself repeatedly trying to prevent that damage. That's just another example of replacement effects only get to apply to an event once. So, in some sense, it's a redundant rule. Prevention effects, they're just a type of replacement effect. Replacement effects don't get to apply to things twice. Um, neither do prevention effects when you're talking about unpreventable damage. Um, a question that I had to ask on the uh, MTG rules list recently was, okay, so what if I have unpreventable damage, like unstable footing, and then I have something like defined deflection, and I say, well, I'm going to prevent the next five damage. Does unstable footing use up my five damage um, shield? And the answer is yes, it does. If, if you cast unstable footing kicked at me, you're going to deal five damage to me, it can't be prevented, um, and it uses up my five-point damage shield. Um, 
actually unstable footing is a bad example because it says damage can't be prevented this turn. But so instead, let's think about um, what's the one? Demon fire. Is that one unpreventable? If you're hellbent or something like that. Demon fire uh, says if you have no cards in hand, the damage from demon fire can't be prevented. So if I demon fire you and I'm hellbent and I demon fire you for five, you're going to take five, even though you've got Define Deflection um, set up for five, and that's going to use up the five points of uh, Prevention Shield. So if I then go and Lightning Bolt you, you're going to take three from the Lightning Bolt as well. It's important to do the unpreventable damage first to use up the shield, and then the preventable damage later once the shield is gone. Does that make sense to you all? Brilliant. I am done. That is prevention effects and replacement effects in not so much a nutshell, but uh, one hour and ten minutes of constant talking. And I didn't even take my shirt off. That's just a extra um, treat for you guys in the chat room. Um, so, uh, you guys in the chat, you've got approximately two minutes to uh, come up with any questions. Um, I absolutely appreciate that the, um, the the examples I've gone through are quite detailed. I was stunned, actually. I thought I knew replacement effects and prevention effects very well. Um, and taking myself through that section, I, I thought, oh, yeah, this would be easy. I could knock this one out in about half an hour or something. No, uh, it's actually taken me an hour and ten minutes. And that's because there's a lot going on in these rules. Um Dr. Y learned something in uh, in this stream. He learned about the order of replacement effects, uh, that there there is an order that you must apply them in. Um, someone commented, it's like the layers of replacement effects. It kind of is. Um, interaction of replacement effects isn't anywhere near as scary as the interaction of continuous effects. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a handful of um, information in there that's very useful. So um, I want to thank Christian Gavrilovich for uh, giving me the idea to cover this section of the rules. Um, and I would like to thank in advance anybody who's there uh, in the chat or watching this later wants to contact me on Twitter. I'm Paul Smithanator, P-A-U-L-S-M-I-T-H-E-N-A-T-O-R. Please contact me with suggestions. Um, what area of the rules would you like me to go over? Um, if I don't get uh, if I don't get suggestions on rules, I don't have a topic in mind of what to cover next week. So I might actually make my first foray into policy documents and try to do the the jar, as it's known, the judging at regular document, uh, and cover exactly what we judges do at uh, regular rail. So um, what do we do? At, what do we do at F and M? How do we fix things that go wrong at F and M? Well, we're entirely driven by this document called the JAR. Uh, if you are a judge, you probably know about it already. If you're a very experienced judge, you might not know about it because your knowledge will have come from the, uh, the, the, the greater rules enforcement document that is the infraction procedure guide. And you might not ever have actually caught up with the JAR to take a look at what newer judges are learning these days. Uh, it's definitely worth it. It's something I'll definitely cover on the stream at some point. It's looking like it's going to be next week if no other um, requests come in. And then I'll start a further foray into policy in general. I will get on to the IPG. I'll, I'll have a look at the NTR, all sorts of other things. And uh, life will be good. Cool. Well, no questions have uh, come up in the chat, so I won't retrace my steps uh, over any of the card examples I've already given you. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this uh, pretty lengthy but nevertheless meaningful and uh, full of information uh, stream on um, <laughs> uh, on replacement effects. Um, I hope you've enjoyed listening to it. I've enjoyed preparing it and uh, bringing this one to you. Uh, so until next week, bye bye. Thanks very much for watching. <laughs>